Hi, my name is Solomon Wang, pronounced as Wong. It's W-A-N-G, pronounced as W-O-N-G. And if you said Wang, that really would be Wong. I'm Vice President of Feed One, a part of Convert of Hope in Springfield, Missouri, which is a faith-based organization with a driving passion to feed the world through children's feeding initiatives, community outreaches, disaster response, and partner resourcing. And I want to talk to you of how your one small act of love and kindness can literally transform the life of a child halfway around the world. Did you know that every day, 16,000 plus children around the world die of hunger, starvation, and malnutrition? I've had the privilege of working with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, India. She once asked a friend of mine who went to interview her, Sir, what do you do for the poor? My friend felt awkward, and a note of embarrassment, he replied, nothing. Without putting a guilt trip on him, Mother Teresa encouraged my friend, you cannot do everything, but everyone, including you, can do something. And if you can't feed a hundred, then just feed one. So it'll be my joy and privilege to speak to you about Feed One. My stories will astound you. My testimonies will amaze you. And my God will change you. I may be the wrong man, but I certainly have the right message for you. So please, be there. If the um, words on the screen or the images look a little skewed, we have been having computer issues this week and um, first thought it might have been a cable, then we realized, well, no, we took it down and people looked at it and said, well, it's working great. I thought, oh, great, I'll smack you. Um, brought it back, it didn't work. So then more diagnosis and we figured it must be a monitor and so we replaced the monitor and um, there was, we were still short a cable. The company didn't have the right cable connection and so that's why this thing looks a little odd or a little skewed up here. Uh, it's not your eyes, you're not going blind, it's, it's none of that. So just, just be aware that uh, we understand that uh, something is going on with this thing and so we're still trying to figure it out. Jeff has been a huge uh, help to us this morning. Uh, as of last night, we could not get any sound or videos to play, but Jeff has bailed us out and um, done a great job. So um, just uh, bear with us and we will, um, we will get this up and running. Um, that's the plan anyway. I'll put it like that. That's, that's, that's the plan anyway. We started this series uh, um, called Without. Without. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, we have talked about. Today we're going to be talking about um, without holiness, no one will see God. Without holiness. Now, when, when we speak of holiness, a lot of times we think of external features. We think, or my mind goes back, raised in the 60s, of women and their beehive hairdos. How many remember those? You have to wonder what on earth was growing in there. Um, we, we think of, 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 of wearing black suits, white shirts. Uh, when I think of legalism, I also tend to think, now I know this is really off the wall, I tend to think of some of the hill country uh, snake handlers in Pentecostal churches. That, that one just drives me crazy. Um, or we tend to think in terms of we don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't run with people who do. We, we come up with that idea of holiness. Growing up in Amarillo, Texas, there was a Pentecostal church that had a television busting service one Sunday night. Bring your television sets in, those evil one-eyed monsters, and we'll just bash them to the glory of God. Never understood that one. Too many times when we think of holiness, we think of legalism. We, we, we speak in a certain way. We, we, we can only use Jean, King James Version. We have to dress a certain way. We cannot smile. We cannot go bowling. We cannot go to roller skating rinks. We cannot have any fun. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus. But when we take a biblical view of holiness, we come up with a completely different idea. 
Biblical holiness does not look like what we, what we visualize sometimes. Well, if I'm going to be holy, I can't have fun. No. I believe, I believe without a doubt that Jesus, when he fellowshiped with those 12 disciples, I think that time and time again, they would just bust out in laughter. I don't have scriptural backing for it. It's just my belief. I, I think, I honestly believe, and again, I don't have scriptural backing for it, but, but I think when, when Peter stepped out of the boat to walk on the sea, going to Jesus, and then he began to look around him, he, he began, to sink, began to sink in the water, and Jesus bailed him out. I, I think that they, later on, when they got to shore, I, I, I must believe, knowing about how a bunch of guys get together, those guys gave him a biggest ribbing. <laughs> hey, Peter, what happened? <laughs> I think they laughed. I think Jesus had fun. And so when we begin to look at biblical holiness, we come up with a wholly different idea. Now, the writer of Hebrews, and this is where our, our foundation scripture is, is, is out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. And here's the phrase, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will will see the Lord. Now, in, in our day and time, in our society of, 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 of exciting worship teams, powerful preaching skills, great big name speakers, television ministries, mega church ministries, creative programs, large crusades, exciting revivals, there is one thing that gets very little attention and emphasis in the church this day. It gets buried in everything else, and that is holiness. We don't want to talk about holiness. And I think one of the problems we have in dealing with holiness, because we know that God has told us to be holy for I am holy. And I think we have a preconceived idea that I can never be holy. Well, bottom line, you can't. But by the grace of God, we can have a holy standing before God Almighty. Not because of what I do, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. Not anything that I do, but it has all been done for us. Jesus came into this world, <clears throat> died, was crucified and died, but rose again where he sits at the right hand of the Father and he is interceding, he is praying for you and for me. Another part of the problem, I think, with this people's concept of holiness is that we think that, that, that it's some state of spiritual depth that makes us more spiritual than other people, or, or that it is some kind of a negative, constructive, constrictive life that is boring and uninteresting. In reality, holiness in the Bible is, a, is an action concept. Holiness is not what we don't do, but it's what we do positively. It's how we react in this life. Holiness in the Bible is almost always connected to, to actual lifestyles, not just a state of mind. It is very powerful, it is very practical, it is very positive. And the basic concept of holiness in, in, in God's word is, is that of separation. You, you, there's two words in the Bible that you kind of have to wrestle back and forth with. One is holiness, the other is sanctification. They very mean very similar, have very similar meanings. The idea of sanctification is what we do in this life to get to a place of holiness. I understand that. I, 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 I realize that. But, but the two words are very, very similar. But they both mean the same thing, that of separation from the world. I've got three little candles here. I've got three over here. But three here, let me take one of them. This has been made holy because it has been separated from the others. Does that have a purpose? Yes, that has a purpose. Your holiness has a purpose also. Part of the difficulties of this world today is they do not see holiness within people's lives, within Christians. And we take the idea of holiness and say, well, I, I, that's just not for me. But yet, the writer of, Proverbs, or of Hebrews says that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He said, whoa, wait a hold the phone. 
Holiness is an absolute necessary as a discipline in our lives. Now, here we go. Let's take a look. Holiness is active, never passive. It is always active. It is not passive. Now, I've given you a scripture out of, uh, out of 1 Peter chapter 1. I'll give you a little bit of time to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. And, and, and notice what Peter is writing here, what he is dealing with here. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, and here's a quote out of the Old Testament, be holy because I am holy. Peter describes the holy life as one who prepares his mind for action. Now, if you have a King James Version that where it says prepare your minds for action, it probably is the phrase, gird up your loins of your mind. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now, now, that meant a great deal in that day and time and in that century because they wore these long flowing robes. And so it's hard to us grasp hold. What in the world does that mean? Many years ago when I was growing up in Amarillo, there was a, a missionary that came to, uh, to, to First Assembly of God. And I remember him having a, a typical garb or, or wardrobe that he uh, put on during service. And during that service, he showed us this idea of girding up your loins. It's an Old Testament phrase, um, a, a King James phrase. But what he said in, in girding up your loins is that they would reach down on the back part of their robe and pull it up, pulling all the fabric up around your thighs, and they would take that part that they pulled up and stick it in their belt to gird up your loins. Basically what we would say in our day and time, you're going to roll up your sleeves and get the job done. So the idea here is to prepare your mind for action. He said preparing to live a holy life begins in your thoughts. It begins in your mind. This is where all of the battle starts and ends is in your mind. If you think you can go through this life thinking, well, I'll never think anything evil, you are already in trouble, boys and girls. It does not work that way. It's not like, well, I'm not going to think about that. Years ago, when I used to watch baseball, Coach came out and talked to his to his 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 pitcher. He said, "Okay, we're in a tough situation here." And he said, "Whatever you do, don't pitch this guy inside." You want to know where the first first pitch went? Don't pitch him inside. And the pitcher winds up, and I mean, he lets one go, and it comes on the inside corner of the plate, and this batter just drills it. Don't throw him in. Don't pitch him inside, because the mental thought was already there. Don't do that. Oh, don't. Yeah, I did that, and it was gone. It was history. Things begin in our mind, good or bad. For instance, when something happens to you, this is just between us, when something happens, doesn't matter what it is, when something happens to you, do you immediately think positive terms or negative terms? Don't tell me, I don't want to know. But when something happens, do you think positive or negative? See, here's the deal. Your neighbor can get a brand new, brand new pickup. And you have a choice of saying, wow, he didn't deserve that. I know they can't afford it, so why is he? Instead of saying, you know, I'm glad that God has blessed him. Or if you get, a, you get an envelope in the mail and, and you open it up and it's a nice little letter for an uh, anonymous person and they have given you $500. Now you have two choices. You can say, bless the Lord, yes. Or you can say, why did this dummy send it through the mail? It could have gotten lost. You see, whatever happens, our minds will go to the negative or the positive. It, it is called a cognitive bias. Something happens and you react. Why? Because that's how you react. So everything begins and ends in your thoughts. 
That's why Peter, or, or, or Paul would write to the Philippian believers. And he said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. When we focus our mind, our thoughts on those things that build the positive rather than the negative, you will find your mind moving in the right direction of pleasing God and serving God because without holiness, we cannot have a relationship with God. Dear friends, holiness is not some spiritual state of joy and delight. It is a verb of action. Now, you're there in 1 Peter chapter 1. Notice that Peter's call to prepare our mind for action. Be self-controlled. Be self-controlled. A man or woman who is, is, who is holy demonstrates the characteristics of self-control in all areas of their life. In other words, you, you determine what comes into your mind and sits there. Paul would write, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to God. This is what we do. We, the battle begins and ends in our mind. Peter says, set your hope fully on the grace that is given to you. Listen, when Peter wrote those words, they were expecting Jesus to come back any minute. They didn't know when he was going to be. They didn't know it was going to be this long. They thought he would come back at any minute. Let me think. I want you to think this through with me. How would you live today if you knew Jesus was coming back at 10 o'clock at night? How would you live today? How would you live your life? Peter says that holiness is more than just rules or laws. It is righteous living. Peter says, uses the word self-control. The King James Version uses the word sober. And it refers to, to avoiding excesses. In our lifestyle, in our society, we tend to live on the excesses. Because we like that. Nita bought some candy the other day. I said, why did you buy that? And she said, well, every now and then I just want one piece of candy. It's a splurge. I'm not eating the whole box. I said, yes, but I will. <laughs> I have problems with excess, especially when it comes to sweets. And he simply tells us to be alert, be self-controlled, be sober in what we do. Do not live a life to the excess. When one sees the real God, the wonder of God and the wonder of his grace. It will drive us to live in such a way that pleases him and not ourselves. This is what holiness is all about. There's a journalist named Bill Moyers wrote a book several years ago called The, I the, the World of Ideas. And in it, he interviewed a guy named Jacob Needleman. Now, Needleman was an observer in 1972 when Apollo 17 blasted off. And Needleman says this, he says it was a night launch and there are hundreds of cynical reporters all over the place, drinking beer, wisecracking, waiting for this 35 story high rocket to blast off into space. And he says the countdown came and then the launch and the first thing you see is this extraordinarily bright light, orange light which is just the, the limit of what you can actually watch because it is so bright. He said everything is illuminated with this light. Then comes this, this, this thing slowly rising up in total silence. And it takes a few minutes for the, for the noise of those engines to come at you and it's like whoosh. It enters right into you. It bounces off of you. He said you can practically hear every jaw dropping. The sense of wonder fills everyone in the whole place as this thing goes up and up and up. Then he said, total, then there's total silence. Not a whisper. And the people who were there, not paying a whole lot of attention, 
didn't care two hoots. People slowly began to get up quietly and someone would help them up. They become kind. They open doors for one another. They look at one another and speak with one another with an interest. These were suddenly moral people who had had a sense of wonder and experienced the wonder. It had made them moral. We have a sense of wonder about God. And we too have our lives changed for the better because of the greatness and the connection we have with God. Peter says in verse 15 and 16, but just as he who is holy, who, is, who called you as holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. The argument Peter uses here is very simple. God is holy, and we have a God in us, and we are to live a holy life. Peter doesn't spend the time arguing about what holiness is or isn't. But if the God of all, all glory, the God of all creation, lives in my heart and life, I have asked him to come into my heart, and take away my sins, take away my guilt and my shame and everything else, then he lives within me. The Holy Spirit lives within me. And when I have the Spirit of God living within me, listen, church, then I have taken the first step to live a holy life that God has called me to do. Because without God, we cannot, without holiness, we cannot see God. Without holiness, we cannot have a relationship with God without holiness within our lives dear friends it is not something we do it is something that we are called to do by the glory and the handiwork of God in our lives God in the life of a believer will express himself in holy living Holiness must be lived each day. Every time we get up, we need to process our mind and our thinking to be self-controlled to do what God has called us to do. And the way you do that is to get into God's Word every morning or every day. You've got to spend time in the Word of God and in prayer, calling upon Him. Because then we begin to recognize the holiness and the greatness of God and that He lives within my life. He lives within your life. Holiness requires us to be active. Never positive, never, never negative. Number two, holiness is attitude and it's personal. Turn to, I've given you, a, yeah, turn to Titus chapter two. I'll give you a little bit of time here. You're not too far away. You're there in, in first Peter. Um, probably go back to your left. Unless you're on a digital, and that's a whole other story. Titus chapter 2. I wasn't going to put these on the, on the uh, slide, but I thought, no, I would rather you take and read it yourself because then you may want to mark something. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live, here's that word again, self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good these then are the things you should teach encourage and rebuke with all authority, do not let anyone despise you. Peter is writing to this young guy, Titus. He bears his name. Verse 12, he says, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. If you kind of go back and read and, and, and understand when Peter wrote these words, it, it can get you dead real quick. It can get you killed. Christians were not favorable at that point. But he simply says, listen, we've got to live lives that are upright, godly lives in this present age. 
And the teachings here about holiness mirrors that of, of, of what Peter had already said. Holiness is a real change in how we live and what we think about. It's not just a religious concept, but it is a concrete lifestyle. And please realize and understand, holy living can alter the landscape of a nation. It is problematic when pastors in large churches and small churches, but it is problematic when the world sees a pastor have a moral failure, they look at the, at the situation and say, well, if he... If you're ugly with the checker at the grocery store, chances are they cannot see God's love in you. Now, here, here's one of my pet peeves, okay? If someone cuts me off in traffic, I tend to lean on my horn. And chances are they can't see God's love in me at that point. Now, it's easy for me to justify that and say, well, they just shouldn't cut in front of me. Deal with that. How often do people see Christ in us? Faith must be played out in our actions and how we touch lives of people. See, it is much harder to deny God when people are confronted with Christians whose faith is very real and practical and loving. One can argue the intellectual dynamics of faith, but to witness faith expressing itself in love is hard to deny. Jesus was the prime example of this. His call to have faith in his heavenly father was hard to resist as he reached out and healed the sick and he raised the dead. He offered forgiveness for, to, to the prostitutes and, and the tax collectors of his day. He could not, they could not resist his love, so they put faith in him. Faith loses its power if it is not coupled with love. Also, we have to understand that faith and works work together. Faith and our works work together. There's a story that a guy operated a little rowboat, a little ferry service from a lake to another part of the lake. Had a rowboat, and he was a good Christian guy, and he figured out a way that he could be a witness. And in the short trip, he would row people from one area to, to another across the lake. On one of his oars, he put, he engraved the word faith. On the other oar, he would engrave the word works. And as he would get his passengers in there, he would start rowing. And the people would no doubt look and see that the two words on each oar, the word on each oar, and they begin to ask him, what, what's with this? What's with these words on these oars, faith and works? And he said, let me show you. He would take the works oar out and he would just roll with the faith. And what had happened, he'd just turn around in circles. He wouldn't go anywhere. Put the faith oar in, put the works oar out, and Roy, same thing. He's going nowhere, but he's going the opposite way in a circle again. When he gets them turned around, he puts both in and starts working. He says it takes faith and it takes work together. And he would use that to let people know what God has done in his life. You see, he said, that is the way it is with the Christian life. Without works, faith without works is dead and works without faith is useless. But by pulling together, there is progress. We can have faith in God, but we've got to have works that shows our faith in God. We've got to be able to do things that show people there is something about this guy or this gal that is different. He moves through life flawlessly without any difficulties because he is roaring with faith and works together. They move in essential the same way. Let me ask you, have you ever met someone who seems to have great faith but no works. I see these on Facebook from time to time. Oh, brother, you just got to pray about that. It's a spiritual problem. Well, I, I appreciate the faith, but there's also on the side that says, you, you've got to get up and do something. 
There can be a certain side of that will turn people off from the gospel. Or we may have seen those who are willing to do works but that have no faith. And it appears they do it for personal attention. Look what I did. The only thing that counts in this life is faith in expressing itself through love. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please yourself. Without faith, it is impossible to please others. Faith is not something that, that, that we do without. It is a necessity. And faith is the very heartbeat of our relationship with God. We must understand that we, have, we come to God in faith, knowing that it pleases Him. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. But the rewards will come because we have faith in God. Father, we bow to you. Holy God, sometimes our faith is weak and we wonder if we will get through. Father, sometimes we just believe that we can do, we can do all that we can do and hope for the best. Oh God, help us to put faith in you and then live life so that others see Jesus in us. Our faith and our works combined together to touch lives for your kingdom. Oh, holy God, help us. Shake us from where we are. Move us to an understanding that you are a mighty God, a holy God, and that you love us deeply and dearly, and that you provided a way, a way to become more acquainted with you, and it is by faith. God, sometimes my faith, I, I wonder how, how, how does this work? And there's no way I can explain it. All I can do, Lord, is decide that you are God and that you're going to take care of everything else. Oh God, we praise you, we thank you. Lord, move us from where we are that we would take faith out and apply it with our works to see people's lives change for your kingdom. Oh God, use us to touch lives with your message of love and mercy and grace and goodness and blessings. Oh, holy God, move us as we're challenged to put our faith and works in the process to see hearts and lives change for you. In the blessed, holy name of Jesus, amen. church with nothing more let me encourage you to find a place right now you may want to come to an altar here or you may want to turn around where you are but I want you to find a place and meet with God and listen to what God would have you to do to put your faith at work pray and ask God what who he would have you to to, to, to be a blessing to and allow your work to be coupled with your faith and to see lives touched with your message. Oh God, speak to hearts. Speak to hearts in the powerful name of Jesus.